The Black Cat by W. J. Wintle. If there was one animal that Sidney disliked more than another, it was a cat. Not that he was not fond of animals in a general way, for he had a distinct affection for an aged retriever that had formerly been his, but somehow a cat seemed to arouse all that was worst in him. It always appeared to him that if he had passed through some previous stage of existence, he might have been a mouse or a bird, and thus have inherited, so to speak, an instinctive dread or hatred for the enemy of his earlier days. The presence of a cat affected him in a very curious fashion. There was, first of all, a kind of repulsion. The idea of the eyes of the animal being fixed on him, the thought of listening for a soundless tread, and the imagined touch of a smooth fur. All this made him shudder and shrink back, but the feeling quickly gave place to a still stranger fascination. He felt drawn to a creature that he feared, much as a bird is supposed, but quite erroneously, to be charmed by a snake. He wanted to stroke the animal and to feel his head rubbing against his hand, and yet, at the same time, the idea of the animal doing so filled him with a dread passing description. It was something like that morbid state in which a person finds actual physical pleasure in inflicting pain on himself. And then there was sheer undisguised fear. Pretend as he might, Sidney was in deadly fear when a cat was in the room. He had tried and tried time and again to overcome it, but without success. He had argued from the well-known friendliness of the domestic cat from its notorious timidity and from its actual inability to do any very serious harm to a strong and active man. But it was all of no use. He was afraid of cats, and it was useless to deny it. At the same time, Sidney was no enemy to cats. He was the last man in the world to hurt one. No matter how much his slumber might be disturbed by the vocal effects of a lovesick marauder on the roof in the small hours of the morning, he would never think of hurtling a missile at the offender. The sight of a half-starved cat left behind when its owner was away in the holiday season filled him with a pity near akin to pain. He was a generous subscriber to the Home for Lost Cats. In fact, his whole attitude was inconsistent and contradictory, but there was no escape from the truth. He disliked and feared cats. Probably this obsession was to some extent fostered by the fact that Sidney was a man of leisure with more urgent matters to occupy his thoughts, he might have overgrown these fancies with the advance of middle age, but the possession of ample means, an inherited dislike for any kind of work calling for energy, and two or three interesting hobbies which filled up his time in an easy and soothing fashion, left him free to indulge his fancies, and fancies, when indulged, are apt to become one's masters in the end, and so it proved with Sidney. He was engaged in writing a book on some phase of Egyptian life in the olden days, which involved considerable study of the collections in the British Museum and elsewhere, as well as much search for rare books among the antiquarian bookshops. When not out on these pursuits, he occupied an old house, which, like most old and rambling places of its kind, was the subject of various queer stories among the gossips of the neighbourhood. Sonic tragedy was supposed to have happened there at some date not defined, and in consequence something was supposed to haunt the place and to do something from time to time. Among the local gossips, there was much value in that nebulous term something, for it covered a multitude of inaccurate recollections and of foggy traditions. Probably Sidney had never heard of the repulsions of this house, for he led a retired life and had little to do with the neighbours. But if tales had reached his ears, he gave no sign, nor was he likely to do so. Apart from the cat obsession, he was a man of eminently balanced mind. He was about the last person to imagine things, or to be influenced by any but proved facts. The mystery which surrounded his untimely end came therefore as a great surprise to his friends, and the horror that hung over his later days was only brought to partial light by the discovery of a diary and other papers which have provided the material for this history. Much still remains obscure, and cannot now be cleared up, for the only man who could perhaps throw further light onto it is no longer with us.
so we have to be content with such fragmentary records as are available. It appears that for some months before his end, Sidney was at home reading in the garden, where his eyes happened to rest upon a small heap of earth that the gardener had left beside the path. There was nothing remarkable about this, but somehow the heap seemed to fascinate him. He resumed his reading, but the heap of earth was insistent and demanding his attention. He could not keep his thoughts off it, and it was hard to keep his eyes off it as well. Sidney was not the man to give away mental dissipation of this kind, and he resolutely kept his eyes fixed on his book. But it was a struggle, and in the end he gave in. He looked again at the heap, and this time with some curiosity as to the cause of so absurd an attraction. Apparently there was no cause, and he smiled at the absurdity of the thing. Then he started up suddenly, for he saw the reason for it. The heap earth was exactly like a black cat, and the cat was crouching as if to spring at him. The resemblance was really absurd, for there were a couple of yellow pebbles just where the eyes should have been. For the moment, Sidney felt all the repulsion and fear that the presence of an actual cat would have caused him. Then he rose from his chair and kicked the heap out of any resemblance to his feline aversion. He sat down again and laughed at the absurdity of the affair, and yet it somehow left a sense of disquiet and a vague fear behind. He did not altogether like it. It must have been about a fortnight later when he was inspecting some Egyptian antiquities that had recently reached the hands of a London dealer. Most of them were usual types and did not interest him, but a few were better worth attention, and he sat down to examine them carefully. He was specially attracted by some ivory tablets, on which he thought he could faintly trace the remains of handwriting. If so, this was a distinct find, for private memoranda of this sort are very rare, and should throw light on some of the more intimate details of private life of the period, which are not usually recorded on the monument. Absorbed in this study, a sense of undefined horror slowly grew upon him, and he found himself in a kind of daydream, presenting many of the uncanny qualities of the nightmare. He thought himself stroking an immense black cat, which grew and grew until it assumed gigantic proportions. Its soft fur thickened around his hands, and twined itself around his fingers, like a mass of silky living snakes, and his skin tingled with multitudinous tiny bites from fangs, which were venomous, while the purring of the creature grew until it became a very roar like that of a cataract, and overwhelmed all his senses. He was mentally drowning in a sea of impending catastrophe, when, by an expiring effort, he wrenched himself free from the obsession and sprang up. Then he discovered that his hand had been mechanically stroking a small, unopened animal mummy, which proved on closer examination to be that of a cat. The next incident that he seems to have thought worth recording happened a few nights later. He had retired to rest in his usual health and slept soundly, but towards morning his slumbers were disturbed by a dream that recalled the kind of nocturnal fear that is common in childhood. Two distant stars began to grow in size and brilliancy until he saw that they were advancing through space towards him with incredible speed. In a few moments they must overwhelm him in a sea of fire and flame. Onwards they came and unfolding like great flaming flowers, growing more dazzling and blinding at every moment. And then, just as they were upon him, they suddenly turned into two enormous cat's eyes, flaming green and yellow. He sprang up in bed with a cry and found himself at once wide awake, and there on the window sill lay a great black cat, glowering at him with lambent yellow eyes, and a moment later the cat disappeared. But the mysterious thing of it all was that the window sill was not accessible to anything that had not wings. There was no means by which the cat could have climbed it, nor was there any sign of a cat in the garden below. The date of the next thing that happened is not clear, for it does not appear to have been recorded at the time. 
but it would seem to have been within a few days of the curious dream. Sidney had occasion to go to a cupboard, which was kept locked. It contained manuscripts and other papers of value, and the key never left his possession. To his knowledge, the cupboard had not been opened for at least a month past. He now had occasion to refer to a collection of notes in connection with his favourite study. On opening the cupboard, he was at once struck by a curious odour. It was not exactly musty, but it could only be described as an animal odour, slightly suggestive of that of a cat. But what at once arrested Sidney's notice and caused him extreme annoyance was the fact the papers had been disturbed. The loose papers contained in some pigeonholes at the back had been drawn forwards into a loose heap on the shelf. They looked for all the world like a nest. They had been loosely arranged in a round heap with a depression in the middle. It looked as if some animal had coiled itself up to sleep there and the size of the depression was just such as would be made by a cat. Sidney was too much annoyed by the disturbance of his papers to be greatly impressed at the moment by their curious arrangement, but it came home to him as a shock when he began to gather the papers together and set them in order. Some of them seemed to be slightly soiled, and on closer examination he had found that they were besprinkled with short black hairs like those of a cat. About a week afterwards he returned later in the evening than usual after attending a meeting of a scientific society to which he belonged. He was taking his latch key from his pocket to open the door when he saw something rubbed against his leg. Looking down he saw nothing, but immediately afterwards he felt it again, and this time he thought he saw a black shadow beside his right foot. On looking more closely, nothing was to be seen, but as he went into the house he distinctly felt something soft brush against his leg. As he paused in the hall to remove his overcoat, he saw a faint shadow which seemed to go up the stairs. It was certainly only a shadow, and nothing solid, for the light was good, and he saw it clearly, but there was nothing in motion to account for the passing shadow, and the way the shadow moved was curiously suggestive of a cat. The next notes in the book that Sidney seems to have devoted to this curious subject appeared to be a series of mere coincidences, and the fact that he thought them worth recording shows only too clearly to what an extent his mind was now obsessed. He had taken the numerical value of the letters C, A, T in the alphabet, 3, 1 and 20 respectively, and by adding them together had arrived at the total 24. He then proceeded to note many ways in which this number played its part in the events of his life, he was born on the 24th of the month at a house whose number was 24, and his mother was 24 years old at the time. He was 24 years old when his father died and left him the master of a considerable fortune. That was just 24 years ago. The last time he had balanced his affairs, he found that he was worth, in invested funds, apart from land and houses, just about £24,000. At three different periods, in different towns, he had chanced to live at houses numbered 24, and that was also the number of his present abode. Moreover, the number of his ticket for the British Museum reading room ended with 24, and both his doctor and solicitor were housed under that same persistent number. Several more of these coincidences had been noted by him, but they were rather far-fetched and not worth recording here. But the memoranda conclude with the ominous question, Will it all end on the 24th? Soon after these notes were written, a much more serious affair had to be placed on record. Sidney was coming downstairs one evening when he noticed in a badly lighted corner of the staircase something that he took to be a cat. He shrank back with his natural dislike for the animal, but on looking more closely he saw that it was nothing more than a shadow cast by some carving on the stairhead. He turned away with a laugh, but as he turned, it certainly seemed the shadow moved. As he went down the stairs, he twice stumbled in trying to save himself from what he thought was a cat in danger of being trodden on. And a moment later, he seemed to tread on something soft that gave way and threw him down. 
he fell heavily and shook himself badly. On picking himself up with the aid of his servant, he limped into the library, and there found that his trousers were torn from a little above the ankle. But the curious thing was that there were three parallel vertical tears, just such as might be caused by the claws of a cat. A sharp smarting led to further investigation, and he then found there were three deep scratches on the side of his leg exactly corresponding with the tears in the trousers. In the margin of the page on which he recorded this incident, he added the words, This cat means mischief, and the whole tone of the remaining entries and the few letters that date from this time shows only too clearly that his mental outlook was more or less tinged and obscured by gloomy forebodings. It would seem to have been on the following day that another disturbing trifle occurred. Sidney's leg still pained him, and he spent the day on a couch with one or two of his favourite books. Soon after two o'clock in the afternoon, he heard a soft thud that might be caused by a cat leaping down from a moderate height. He looked up, and there on the window sill crouched a black cat with gleaming eyes, and a moment later it sprang into the room, but it never reached the floor, or did it? It must have passed through it. He saw it spring. He saw for the moment in mid-air. He saw it about to alight on the floor, and then it was not there. He would have liked to have believed this was a mere optical delusion, but against that theory stood the awkward fact that the cat, in springing down from the window, knocked over a flower pot, and there lay the broken pieces in evidence of the fact. He was now seriously scared. It was bad enough to find himself seeing things that had no objective reality, but it was far worse to be faced by happenings that were certainly real, but not to be accounted for by ordinary laws of nature. In this case, the broken flower pot showed that if the black cat was merely what we call a ghost, for lack of a more convenient term, it was a ghost that was capable of producing physical effects. If it could knock a flower pot over, it could presumably scratch and bite, and the prospect of being attacked by a cat from some other plane of existence will hardly bear of being thought of. Certainly it seemed that Sydney had real ground for alarm. The spectre cat, or whatever one likes to call it, in some way gaining power, was now able to manifest its presence and hostility in more open and practical fashion. The same night saw a proof of this. Sidney dreamed that he was visiting a zoological garden when a black leopard of ferocious aspect escaped from its cage and sprang upon him. He was thrown backwards to the ground and pinned down by the heavy animal. He was half crushed by its weight. Its claws were at his throat. Its fierce yellow eyes were staring into his face when the horror of the thing brought the dream to a sudden end and he awoke. As consciousness returned, he was aware of an actual weight on his chest, and opened his eyes, he looked straight into the depths of two lambent yellow flames, set in a face of velvet black. The cat sprang off the bed and leaped through the window, but the window was closed, and there was no sound of breaking glass. Sidney did not sleep much more that night, but a further shock awaited him on rising. He found some small blood stains on his pillow, and an inspection before the looking glass showed the presence of two groups of tiny wounds on his neck. They were little more than pinpricks, but they were arranged in two semicircular groups, one either side of the neck, and just such as might be caused by the cat trying to grasp the neck between its two forepaws. This was the last incident recorded in Sydney's diary and the serious view that he took of the situation is shown by certain letters that he wrote during the day. Final instructions to his executors, and settling various details of business, evidently in view of his approaching end. What happened in the course of the final scene of the tragedy, we can only guess from the traces left behind, but there is sufficient evidence to show that the horror was an appalling one. The housekeeper seems to have been awakened once during the night by a strange noise which she could only describe as being like an angry cat snarling, while the parlour-maid, whose room was immediately above that occupied by Sydney, says that she dreamt that she heard her master scream horribly once or twice. In the morning, Sydney did not answer when called at his usual hour, and as the door was found to be locked, 
The housekeeper presently procured assistance and had it broken open. He was found crouching on the floor and leaning against the wall opposite the window. The carpet was saturated with blood and the cause was quickly evident. The unfortunate man's throat had been torn open on either side, both jugular veins being severed. So far as could be made out, he had retired to bed and had been attacked during sleep and the sheets were bespattered with blood. He had apparently got out of bed in his struggles to overcome the thing that had him fast in its fearful grip. The look of horror on his distorted face was said by the witnesses to be past description. Both window and door were fastened, and there was nothing to show how his assailant entered, but there was something to show how it left. The bloodstains on the floor recorded the footprints of a gigantic cat. They led across the floor from the corpse to the opposite wall, and there they ceased. The cat never came back, but whether it passed through the solid wall or melted into thin air, no one knows. In some mysterious way, it came and went, and in passing, it did this deed of horror. It was a curious coincidence that the tragedy took place on Christmas Eve, the day of the 24th of the month. End of the Black Cat